As professional dog trainers, we get asked lots of questions in classes, and this week we thought we would uh, answer some of the questions that you guys are asking us in our videos, and that's what we're going to do. So I'm Ken. I'm Cal. And welcome back to McCann Dogs. Thanks for joining us here at McCann Dogs, where every single week we help you enrich your dog's life and help your dog to become a well-behaved four-legged family member. And let's get right into the first question. So the first question comes to us from Rough House Dog Training and Behavior Modification. And they ask, how do you fix the curving when they start to back up? And that's from uh, one of our Walk Backwards videos. So uh, what do you think, Kale? Do you want to answer uh, that? Yeah, I've actually had that problem uh, with my own dogs uh, a couple times. They seem to like to curve one way um, just naturally. So uh, one of the things that I have done uh, to correct that or to help them is when I'm in initially teaching them to back up, I use almost like a channel or a chute. So with uh, my last puppy, uh, when I was working on it, I had um, worked in the hallway and I just put a couple chairs up along the side. So I left a little bit wider of a space than, than her body width so that when she backed up, it sort of channeled her to back up straight in the, in the correct direction. And then I would yes and reward and throw the food to her so that she would be reinforced for going straight. And then I sort of gradually moved the, uh, the chairs away. Um, and then another um, method that I also used was teaching the dog to back up until they could put their feet on something, whether it be like a linoleum to a mat or something to a little um, uh, raised plank or something like that. And then I could sort of place that behind the dog so they'd have to back up and almost reach behind them to find it. And that would also control uh, their direction of the of the backup. Of course, the dog needs to know the backup quite well to do this. Um, but both both methods seem to be successful. There we go. All right, next question. Uh, actually, we're going to put two questions together. And, um, our uh, teacher puppy to love retrieving and teacher pup yeah, puppy love to love bringing video. the toy back to you. Yeah, Beeline's really cute in this <laughs> video. But we had a couple of questions on, and they're kind of along the same lines. So we're, we're going to bring them together. So um, the qu first question from Red Sherbet. Will any dog enjoy fetch? I would have said Red Sherbert. Uh, Only because I love sherbet, but yeah. it is definitely sherbet. <laughs> I think it's sherbet. Or is it sorbet? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think the name is Red Sherbet. Uh, <laughs> they also have a very cute profile picture. But um, So, uh, will any dog enjoy fetch? And secondly, from um, Essie Girl 85 uh, when my Border Collie was a pup, he loved toilet roll tubes. He didn't seem to like any other toys much, but he loved these. He's now into Frisbee, but he ends up biting his tongue quite often. So Ooh. these are strangely related, these two questions. Mm -hmm. So why don't we talk about that a little bit? Um, so first off, will any dog enjoy fetch? Uh, no, actually, not all dogs enjoy fetch. Uh, some dogs naturally are born with a lot of food drive or a lot of toy drive. Um, and sometimes, depending on how they are raised, uh, a dog that had a lot of toy drive to begin with, if that's not sort of nourished and encouraged from their owners and their family, um, that toy drive can diminish and can go yeah. away. Uh, or the opposite can happen. If you have a dog that doesn't have a lot of natural drive for toys, there are lots of techniques that you can do to build that drive uh, for dogs. But there are certainly some dogs that are just crazy in love with toys and love to play fetch and that they could just do it all day long. And other dogs that do it um, for the sake of ple pleasing their owner right. or just because it's a trained trick, but they don't necessarily find it as internally rewarding. Um, so it it's, comes down to a bit of training and some different strategic things, which sounds like a great video. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, it's something that we'll, we'll cover <clears throat> in the future. But I yeah. think any you can teach any dog to fetch. Whether they all enjoy fetching or not is all about the currency of reward. If you can find something yeah. that they really love uh, as a, a reward or um, for fetching or that they love to fetch, uh, I think it's perfect. Yeah. And when we talk about Essie Girl 85's comment that her Border Collie uh, puppy loved <clears throat> to fetch toilet roll tubes, that's really uh, part of finding that thing, finding that high currency reward uh, or valuable thing for your dog to retrieve. Now going on to the second part of Essie Girl 85's question, he's now into Frisbee but he ends up biting his tongue quite often and it's something that I know both Kale and I love as a uh, fetch toy or as a retrieve toy is uh, the soft Frisbees mm -hmm. or the fabric Frisbees. Love them. Yeah, I really like them. Um, I find that they they f uh, throw f uh, quite nicely um, and the dogs uh, can grab them really easily. I always teach my dogs to play Frisbee initially with a soft Frisbee because it's really easy for them to catch. It's not as difficult as something that's a bit um, harder plastic or harder material um, and no biting tongues. <laughs> yeah, right. It's uh, much, much safer for them. Um, 
I mean, if you're into disc dog, they have really good quality frisbees mm -hmm. that fly really nicely, go long distance, and um, the dogs can catch those really well. But you want to stay away from the promo type uh, frisbees that yeah. they often hand out. They're, they're great. Brittle. They're cute, yeah. but they're not really super great for your dog's mouth. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. Okay, this next question is from Rachel Bata. I'm hoping I'm saying her last name correctly. Um, it's more of a, a comment, actually, rather than a question. And it has to, uh, it's in reference to um, the thunderstorm video that we put out on uh, ways and suggestions to help your dog uh, be calm um, or be less stressed during that moment. And she sent some of the things that, that she's done with her dogs, which are excellent. Um, so she says, we let our puppy hear sounds off YouTube, off our TV, very low, then gradually increase sound level. Um, things like thunderstorm traffic, uh, fireworks, barking dogs, crowds of people, musical instruments, uh, beach water store, uh, shore, excuse me, even Halloween scary sounds. She really covers all bases, yes, I think. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. uh, even uh, helped with kids at the door, which is awesome. Daisy has no uh, issues with any of these now. She is three years old and still sleeps through uh, night storms. So that great suggestion. Yeah, that's a really great way to, um, to help you to desensitize your dog um, through any of these problems. And one of our suggestions that we made actually in the video. So if, um, you know, any sort of uh, environmental sounds, taking uh, music, uh, again, these sounds, uh, playing them while you're gone. Really, really great ways to help your dogs through any of these scenarios. So that was a great job by you, Rachel, for, for helping your dog through these the environmental sound issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next one's actually a comment comes from Davis Tran after watching um, How to Stop Using Food in Training. Mm -hmm. um, he says, already understood the sequence of saying the command right before the action of luring in order to get the dog to predict the, the action after it hears the verbal cue, but I never thought of having food in front of the dog's face uh, as you say the verbal cue as a distraction. And it really would um, slow down um, the, the, that aspect of training, but mm -hmm. why don't we talk about why we do that, like how there is a distraction if you have food in, in front of your dog's face while you say the command. Yeah, I think two things happen. Um, number one, if the food is in front of the dog's face, some dogs are, especially if they're highly food motivated, they tend to focus uh, on the food so much that they go through the motions of what you're luring them or showing them to do, but they're not actually comprehending the word that you're putting with it because they're so focused on getting the food. Um, where other dogs sometimes become very dependent on that step. So unless you show your hand with the food uh, before giving them a command, you can tell them sit, 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 or whatever you're saying all day long and they just sort of wait and anticipate for the, the hand and the food to come forward. So those are the two most important reasons why we try to eliminate that step. So give the command clearly, and then within that one second time frame, add the signal and the food one second later to show the dog what we want. Yeah, which is why timing is so important. You bet. Next question comes from, uh, is tugging with your dog a bad idea uh, from the video there? It comes from the light up north. And why don't you read the question for us, Kelly? Uh, thanks for the tips. If your dog's teeth do touch your hand, what is the best way to teach them that that's not okay? So this is during um, playing tug with your dog. Um, will they connect pausing or stopping the game with the action of their teeth or mouth contacting your hand or skin? Um, and yes, they absolutely will, especially if your dog finds playing and interacting with you uh, very motivating and rewarding. So if you're having a game and your dog does anything that you don't like, and it, it could be something more than, you know, biting your hands, it could be jumping up or scratching you or um, whatever it might be. Anything that you don't like, you can um, basically let your dog know that by stopping the game altogether. Um, I will say one common error I see people do is when they go to stop the game, they often try to pull the dog's toy out of the dog's mouth. And that actually for a lot of dogs is like the most fun thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. It almost is like you're continuing to play the game. Yeah, that's a great so point. one of the better strategies is to actually make the toy go completely still and very, very boring. You can even like brace it against your, your uh, leg and um, stop all of the fun so your dog's not so stimulated anymore so that they sort of go, oh, this is really boring. Whatever I just did didn't really seem to make the game very engaging. And when the dog sort of stops and settles, then you can start the game again as if to say, I like that behavior better. Now let's try it again. So that can often be a, a good way to stop it, provided that the dog's pretty cooperative. Yeah, for sure. And marking the behavior with your voice, like that oops or ouch or something. Mm -hmm. um, but rather than pulling the toy away, just making it much less interesting. Absolutely. The next one's actually a comment rather than a question. It comes from Canine Crazy. 
Hi, and it's from um, our video that had to do with how to deal with a uh, uh, lost dog emergency. Um, so her question was, when we rescued our dog, uh, the RSPCA told us that we shouldn't put her name in the tag because she responds to her name so well, so it would make it easier for someone to steal her because they would respond to them as well. Um, and uh, Ken and I have a little bit of a difference of opinion on this one. Uh, I agree with this. I uh, When I travel, I, um, I purposely do not put my dog's names on on uh, their collars, on their tags. Uh, I just have my email address and I have my telephone number um, just because my dogs are really well trained and if somebody was to start calling their name, they would uh, probably go right along with them perfectly, uh, perfectly well. Mm -hmm. um, but they would also respond to normal commands like come or here yep. as well. So right. I don't know. So it just, it provides uh, more backup to my opinion, which is uh, that, I mean, it gets on depends, it, it depends on where you live. Um, but I feel like I would have, my, I want to have my dog's name on their tag um, because what's the likelihood that someone is going to find them? What's, I, I think it's more valuable to have their name on their tag so that if they were lost, someone were to know their name and be able to uh, better assist them and you in getting them back. But um, I mean, it's so unlikely that someone would want to steal your dog and would be close enough. If, they, if they're close enough to read their tag, they've already got them. So that's my opinion anyway. This is true. Which is probably right. Yeah, so opinion. I think the, the moral of the story is that it doesn't really matter uh, what you do. <laughs> You can put whatever you want on your dog's collar, um, yeah. but hopefully you're not in a scenario or a situation where that something that terrible would happen. Yeah, for sure. Um, but I think it's good if the dog will respond to somebody because if somebody can get a hold of them and get them safe, mm -hmm. then that's your best bet. And I'm hopeful that whoever gets the dog will check their microchip, yeah. and then that's going to lead them back to me as well, which is why it's important to microchip your dogs. For sure. And I have no further comment because I feel like I actually won. Next uh, question or, or comment comes from um, World Towning, and I actually subscribe. We actually subscribe to these guys, World Towning. They have mm -hmm. a very cool family vlog that teaches families how to um, travel all over the world um, and live in a different town. It's very mm -hmm. cool, um, and it comes on our "How to Stop Your Dog from Jumping Up" video. Uh, World Towning says. Is it normal to have a dog on the leash all the time? I've not had a dog in a while, but that is not a practice that I usually did, and this is a great point. Yeah, um, this is something that we do normally do. Um, we sort of do the opposite. So when we have a young puppy, we start out with them on uh, a leash or even just a, a light line so it's not quite so invasive in the house. Um, and then we start with that on so that when um, the puppy is bound to make mistakes when they're young and they don't have much life experience, we can redirect them um, really easily uh, and help them to not learn you know, bad behaviors in the house. And this particular one was um, stopping them from jumping on people when they come in the house. So the leash is a really, really great way to prevent a problem from developing into to something that happens and becomes a habit. Um, versus waiting longer for the dog and getting them a ch giving them a chance to jump on people or chew things in your house or whatever it might be and then you're trying to run around and catch them and get control because you don't have a leash on so basically what we do with our dogs is um, when they're young if we sort of see that they're starting to listen well to their basic commands then we might graduate to like a shorter leash or something really small um, and then eventually we work to being able to to be off leash but then we're also ready to put the leash back on if they go through like a little terrible two stage where they sort of become a bit of an adolescent like you know six seven eight months um luckily knock on plastic mm -hmm. <laughs> uh beeline is at that exact age and she's been really good lately so. yeah she's been really great but again if you start to good encounter basics. any problems you can always take a step back and put the dog back on a long line Absolutely. or a leash just um, for safety's sake mm -hmm. Uh, the next question we have is uh, um, from our other backup video that we made, a little bit different one, Teach Your Dog to Back Up, and it's from Macy Lunden. Um, what do you do if your dog doesn't back up when you walk towards them? My dog will sit when I walk towards her, and I don't know how to change that. Yeah, and that's a pretty common problem that people mm -hmm. encounter Very when common. they're training the backup trick. And um, there's sort of a couple steps that you can do, and um, probably one of the most important is your hand position, where your hand is as you're backing up mm -hmm. with your dog. Um, a lot of times if you increase the social pressure, allow your dog out of that sit and increase the social pressure by moving a little bit closer, your dog will naturally back up. Mm -hmm. But if you encounter the situation where they sit and it's like a hard sit, you can't get them out of the sit, then watch where your hands are. It's uh, helpful if you get your hands down to sort of their spine level and in line with their neck. As you step into them, they're less likely to feel like it's a sit lure and feel like you're trying to get them into that sitting position. So watch your hands, keep them at the same line as their collar or their neck and step into them to encourage them to back. 
back up. Yeah, which means if you have a small dog, and I can see a picture of a CKC Spaniel on her little profile here, yeah. which means that They're dog's at dog. like knee, knee level, they're the yeah. sweetest dogs ever. Yeah. Um, so you would need to bend right over in order to uh, get that dog to, to keep its head straight. Um, when you have the, the food high, the dog often will naturally lift their head to look mm -hmm. up at the food, and when you step into them, they will put all of the weight into their back end. That's actually a technique that we have used to teach sit in front after a recall. So mm -hmm. keeping the head lower and um, keeping the hands sort of so that the spine and head line up uh, will often fix that right away. Mm -hmm. So good luck with your backup training. Cute dog. <laughs> All right, next question comes on um, how to teach your dog to jump up into your arms. And it comes from um, Cakes, it looks like. Uh, my dog doesn't listen to words. They don't get words. If I say help every time, they do it right. I think they should get it, but when I say help with helping them, uh, they don't get, uh, they don't understand me. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. But um, so let's talk a little bit about trick training. And if you're moving ahead too quickly and you're using a command and it's not working, what, what should uh, our, video, our viewers do? Well, basically any any time with whether it's tricks or any any skill that you're trying to train your dog, if you're starting to use a verbal command and you're not getting a response from your dog, you need to consider why is it that the dog's being a bit of a uh, brat and they're not responding because they would rather do something else or is it confusion and if it's confusion then definitely what we want to do is go back a few steps and help the dog to be successful and go to whatever step the dog is responding reliably um, what I always like to say about trick training specifically though is that tricks aren't a test so if you you know use a verbal command and then have some body language and some encouragement as well there's absolutely nothing wrong with that one of the things that we love about trick training is that the way we do it is purely positive training so um, you know if the dog's struggling we just use more tools to, to help the dog to be successful to build their confidence and to let them have a lot of fun so I, I think it's great that she wants to have things uh, just on a, a verbal command I think yeah. is what she's getting here um, but I also don't think it's the end of the world to, to help the dog uh, a little bit more and again consider if the dog's struggling because they're unsure or maybe they're just distracted and she needs to change the environment that she's practicing in. For sure. I mean, uh, I mean all of these skills are built on a solid foundation of success. So right. you need to be successful before you move forward. And if you encounter a situation where it's too hard, then just take a step back and help your dog out a little bit more. Absolutely. Next question comes from Gelder Hooves um, from our 8 Fun Tricks You Can Teach Your Dog To Do. That video's got almost uh, half a million views, like 350,000 so awesome. views or something like that. Yeah. Um, Mr. Hummer. We've featured, yeah, a, a Border Collie Cross named Hummer and uh, the other uh, Border Collie Cross, all Canadian, named F our Funky Monkey. Um, but Gelder Hooves asks, why is there a dog sitting in a chair in the background? <laughs> I think this is really funny. Yeah, I don't know what else you do with chairs. Do yeah. you want to just sit on the floor like an animal? I know. Why Why on earth would you ever leave a dog on the floor? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but Kale's actually got a really great reason for that. Yeah. Um, I often, if I'm training more than one dog, um, I uh, ask one of the dogs to sort of wait somewhere, whether it's up on a chair, if that happens to be what's there and convenient, which was that was the case at the time of that video, uh, or like a dog bed or something like that. Or sometimes I'll have them go in a crate, but I'll leave the crate door open and the reason why I do that is I like that dog that's waiting its turn to have to show some type of self-control while I'm training another dog and then I'll often switch them so um my dogs are pretty funny, so if I'm working them in a group, I can actually say to the dogs, you know, Grand Slam's turn, and he will leave the pack and come and work, and everybody else knows that that's not their name, and they have to wait at whatever they're doing, and then I can send him back to a chair or to a table, and then I can call another one out to do training. Um, it definitely allows me to train more dogs in <laughs> a much smaller amount of time, but uh, there is method to my madness in it, is so that the other dogs are sort of having to use their brains at the same time Teaching rather than... them to be mindful. Yeah. It's really, it's really an impressive trick. Yeah, I actually didn't too. really realize that it was trip, that was that unique because I'm so used to doing it. So yeah. I think it's really funny that someone watching the video would would notice I that. Know. So it's pretty cool. It was cool. Um, and on that, uh, and on that note, we're going to wrap this up. I want to thank you guys for joining us. If this is your first time with us, make sure you hit that subscribe button. We publish new videos every single Thursday to help you enrich your dog's life and to help your dog to become a well-behaved four-legged family member. And we're going to be doing these comment, uh, answer, question things uh, more frequently because I think um, it would be good for our channel, you know, to, to, to give back, answer questions. You know, yeah, there's great, questions great videos. questions and great comments. Um, so hopefully if we can clarify things or um, even come up with new ideas for more videos and things that you guys want to see, we would love to hear it. It's perfect. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. post your uh, questions in the comment section below. And uh, on that note, I'm Ken Steep. I'm Kel Kim. Happy training. Bye for now. <laughs>